Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our midweek Lenten worship experience. I know this isn't exactly what we hope to do during Lent, but we want to be able to continue our journey to the cross, our journey through the Psalms of Ascents, the journey that we started on Ash Wednesday, even though we have to practice a little bit of social distancing. And so tonight, we are going to do this online through this video. I know it's not exactly what we want, but it's what we have to do. And so we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Turn us again, O God of our salvation, that the light of your face may shine on us. May your justice shine like the sun, and may the poor be lifted up. Joyous light of glory, of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation, and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship experience will now continue with the readings that we had for tonight. Starting with Psalm 129. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Let Israel say, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth, but they have not gained the victory over me. Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows long. But the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. A reaper cannot fill his hands with it, nor one who gathers fill his arms. May those who pass by not say to them, The blessing of the Lord be on you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Our reading from the Passion according to Matthew continues with the 26th chapter, verses 57 through 75. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now you who have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. 
Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken, Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This week we are continuing our journey through a pilgrim's passion, looking at a group of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent and partnering it with the passion readings from Matthew's Gospel. Now the psalm that I just read to you, Psalm 129, is definitely a psalm of ascent, but it's more than that, it actually does double duty. And what I mean by that is that this is also what's known as an imprecatory psalm. Imprecatory is just a fancy word for the type of psalm that it is. And in an imprecatory psalm, what happens is the psalmist cries out to God and says, that group over there, God, get them. It's time to hit the smite button. It's time to rain your wrath down on them. They have been mistreating me. They are outside of your mercy. You should just utterly wipe them out. The most infamous example of an imprecatory psalm is Psalm 137. In that psalm, the Jewish exiles, as they are being brought into the city of Babylon, cry out to God in sorrow, in anger, in a desire for vengeance. They want to see the people who are mistreating them, well, basically pay for it. It culminates in all of their sorrow and anger for a wish that the Babylonian children all be slaughtered. Now, by imprecatory psalm standards, Psalm 129 seems a little tame. This isn't an individual crying out for God to act. Instead, it's all of Israel crying out. They are saying, we are being oppressed by our enemies. God, please do something about it. In verse 3, we hear them talking about how it feels like they are being whipped. And so they cry out to God and they say, for example, in verses 5 through 7, May all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. A reaper cannot fill his hands with it, nor one who gathers fill his arms. Now I know what you're thinking. That's a really strange picture there, right? And yet there's an easy way to explain this. Back then, when the people of Israel were building their houses, they would often take dirt up onto the top of their house and pack the dirt into their roof as a form of insulation. And when they would do that, they would sometimes grab grass seed with them. And so they would take the grass seed up onto the roof without realizing it, pack it into the dirt accidentally, and then when the time came, grass would start springing up on the rooftops. But because there wasn't the depth of soil necessary, well, that grass would wither quickly. We heard the way the psalmist describes it, that a reaper can't even gather a handful of that grass. That is what the psalmist wants to happen to Israel's enemies. May they be like roof grass. May they wither and fall apart soon. Ouch, right? That may seem very harsh to us now. Coming across such raw anger and emotions in the Bible may make us feel a little uncomfortable. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we're going to admit that we understand that kind of anger. We understand that kind of frustration because, let's be honest, we've felt that way at times too. There are times when we may be tempted to say, like the psalmist did, Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows long. When it feels like the forces of life around us have plowed our back, have beaten us and left, 
those long ridges in them. Now, you know, I could have probably tried to come up with an example right now, but I'd be willing to bet that as I've been talking about this, as I've been talking about this desire to see God smite your enemies, that you've been filling in the blanks. That you've been thinking of people or situations that you are upset about, and you wouldn't mind seeing some divine retribution rain down upon them. Well, hey, let's just talk about the elephant in the room right now. Seeing as right now I'm sitting in an empty sanctuary talking to a camera for crying out loud. COVID-19. We may be looking at that and wishing that God would make COVID-19 like roof grass. That it would just wither and go away because of the way it's disrupting our lives. Or maybe not the virus itself. Maybe we're looking at individuals whose reactions haven't been as helpful as we think it should be. And we say, boy, it would be nice if you would get yours. Maybe it's not COVID-19, though. Maybe there's something going on at your work. A person that you don't like, a family member or a former friend who's been causing you stress. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's just a situation. Maybe it's an illness, not just COVID-19, but any illness. Maybe it's financial stress, stresses or relationship woes. Maybe the person that you want to see face divine justice is God himself. Now, I know we're not supposed to talk like this, and it makes us uncomfortable, but let's be honest, there have been times when all of us have been angry with God. We look at the things that are going on in our lives and we say, God, why would you let this happen? Where are you? Why aren't you fixing this? And we know that we're not supposed to feel that way. We know that we're not supposed to act that way. We know deep down that that's not how we react, but we are human and we have those emotional reactions to life. God understands it. Why do you think he gives us the imprecatory Psalms in the Bible? He says, I not only know that you're going to be angry, but I want to give you a script you can use when you're angry. It's all right. He understands anger, even if it's anger directed at him. Like I said, we understand the anger and frustration that we find in the imprecatory Psalms because we often experience it as well. That's why we should pay attention to what the psalmist goes on to say. In verse 4, the psalmist says this, but the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. The psalmist understood that even though he was surrounded by enemies on all sides, even though he was facing difficulties and he felt like his back had been plowed open, he still trusts in God because he knows that God is with him and will protect him. See, here's the thing that really got me as I was looking at this psalm. Everything that the psalmist talks about is something that could have been said by Jesus himself because it describes his life so perfectly. The psalmist talks about how he's been oppressed from his youth. Well, so is Jesus. Think about what happened right after Jesus was born. King Herod the Great found out about his birth and that paranoid old man tried to wipe him out. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he faced oppression and opposition from those who were in power, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. Think about what happened in the reading from the Passion that we heard just a few moments ago. Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin and put on trial. Even though his enemies can't get the charges to stick, they can't get the witnesses' stories to agree with each other, 
He is still convicted of a crime he didn't commit, and he's sentenced to death. His enemies mock him. They beat him. Soon he'll be taken before the Roman governor, where the Roman soldiers will continue the mocking and the punishment, where Jesus will be scourged. His back will become like a plowed field. And eventually, it'll look like his enemies have won. He'll march through the streets of Jerusalem in disgrace, carrying his cross to the place of execution where he will die. And yet the words of the psalm apply even here. In verse 2, the psalmist says, even before he starts talking about how he's been mistreated, Even before he brings his complaint to God, he says, they have not gained the victory over me. That's true of Jesus. It looked like his enemies had won. After all, he had been crucified. He died in shame. And yet because Jesus did that, He wins the victory. He wins the victory over sin and death and the devil for us, for our sake. That is the good news that we're journeying towards. Every step of the way that we go through Lent brings us closer and closer to that day of victory for Jesus. When yes, His life will be poured out on the cross, but by doing so, he wins the victory over his enemies, his true enemies, over sin, over death, over the devil. And that victory isn't just for him. It's for us as well. That is why we can say, like the psalmist did, The Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are cut free from the sin that entwined us. We are cut free from the death that looms over us. We are set free from the condemnation that our sins deserve. We are given the victory through him. And that is a wonderful wonderful gift that God gives us. And because he has done that, we can say, just as the psalmist did, they have not gained the victory over me. Now I know that there are times when it's difficult to say that, like say, right now, as we're practicing social distancing, as we're hearing stories and rumors about how bad things are and how bad things could get. I know that there are still going to be times when we react with anger and frustration and sorrow over the things that happen in this world. But we can take a lesson from this psalm. Like I said earlier, it's amazing to me that God inspired the psalmists to include imprecatory psalms in the Bible. God wasn't scared of the raw emotions that we encounter in those psalms. Instead, he leaves them here as an example for us to say, when you are feeling those intense emotions of anger and frustration and rage, no matter who they're directed to, bring them to me? Does it feel as if the world has been plowing open your back? Come to me in that pain. Are you so angry that you wish that people would turn out to be like roof grass and just wither away to nothing? Come to me. Come to have the cords untangled and cut free from you. Come to partake in the victory that Christ has gained for you through his death and resurrection. Come and be set free. 
come to find hope and meaning and life in me. That's why it's good for us to remember something that Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John. He said this to them before he was arrested, before he was put on trial, before he was executed. He said this just a few hours before all of this started. What he said was this, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes, in this world, we are going to have trouble. We will see that trouble looming on every side. But when it does, we know who we can run to. We know who we can approach. We know who we can go to to find victory and comfort when things turn bad. We turn to our Lord. We cry out to him because the Lord is righteous. He has cut us from the cords of the wicked. And for that reason, they have not gained the victory. Thanks be to him. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Even though we may be separated by miles and distance, even though we are not together in this one place, let us now come together and lift up to God our cares and concerns, trusting that he not only hears us, but that he answers our prayers according to his good and gracious will. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that in this world we will have trouble. We see that trouble around us on every side. And so we pray that you would remind us that we have victory in you. Victory through Jesus' death and resurrection. Victory over sin, death, and the devil. When troubles loom, when we are stirred up with fear and anger and sorrow, Remind us to come to you, to find comfort, to find peace, to find the victory that only you can give. Lord, during this difficult time of fear and uncertainty, help us to find refuge in you. We pray that you would be with those people who have been impacted by COVID-19 those who have contracted the illness, those who are suffering from it even now, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones because of it. We pray that you would be with the doctors and nurses on the front line right now, who are struggling to keep up, who are worried about what might happen. We pray that you would fill them with confidence, hope, and comfort. Be their strength and shield during this difficult time. We also lift up to you, Lord, those who are in authority over us, our elected leaders and officials who are trying to figure out the best course forward. We pray that you would fill them with wisdom and understanding, that you would help them to chart the best course forward so that we may ride through this storm protected by you. We pray that you would be with all of us whose lives have been disrupted by this pandemic. We pray that you would give us patience and wisdom as we go forward. That you would help us to remain calm, but also that you would help us see the need around us. Help us to be living extensions of your care and concern for everyone, and help us to watch over and take care of those who need that help. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us going forward, that you would be with us through this journey of life. We entrust everything that is weighing heavily upon our hearts and minds to you, using the words that your Son taught us, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always. Amen. So this concludes our worship experience for tonight. Again, we're sorry that we can't meet in person the way that we usually would, but again, out of Christian love and concern for those around us, we are practicing social distancing techniques. This Sunday at 9.30, we will be having a special online worship experience as well. And again, next week, we will continue our Lenten journey at 7 o'clock also. We pray that you would be blessed during this difficult time, that you would find comfort in Him. And remember, God loves you, and so do we. Have a good evening.